thanks so much for being here and for your participation in the conference. We're really happy that you uh, were part of it, Kate. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, off the top, um, what are kind of the main challenges that you've seen in your own in your own work, but more generally as well, with respect to ensuring defendants' rights and uh, fair trial standards, both in cases of international crimes and cases relating to terrorist offenses? And are there differences in the way that these challenges are expressed or in how you've seen them uh, in these types of cases? I mean, so the right to a fair trial is sort of this cornerstone and, and fundamental right. And I think we're all pretty good at knowing what it means and understanding it. The problem is its application. And the application of fair trial rights to all accused has, has to be universal, whether or not someone's charged with you know, theft or terrorism or international crimes like genocide or crimes against humanity. Um, I think it's hard to ignore that there's a certain stigma that attaches to accusations of terrorism and terrorism crimes. Um, so I think as a legal community, we have to be even more vigilant that investigation and prosecution of these crimes does ensure compliance with international human rights standards, including the right to a fair trial, because we've all seen that, that counter-terrorism strategies that don't have a rule of law approach at the centre risk you know, real harm. They risk, you know, further radicalisation, you know, an increase in terrorist acts and groups. So um, putting this sort of, the rights of the accused at the heart of any um, approach to accountability, I think, is central. So logically, I think, and rationally, everybody would kind of agree with you, a human rights and rights-centred approach to, uh, to, to these trials and to counter-terrorism uh, would make for better trials, better justice, and better counterterrorism. And yet, very often, this isn't what happens. What do you think? What do you think is going on? Why isn't it that that, that those ideas aren't convincing those who actually end up prosecuting uh, these types of cases? Um, I don't even think it's a conscious decision, Mark. I don't think we're having law enforcement officers or or prosecutors or judges who think, well, this is a terrorism case, so I'm going to cut some corners. But I think there are real danger zones when it comes to prosecuting terrorism as a crime. Um, an obvious one is that this is a crime that's viewed as being a crime against the state. It's an attack on the regime, it's an attack on the government. So there's less care taken in terms of public officials and even high public officials speaking out and saying this person is a terrorist, they're going to pay, don't worry, you're all safe. And there's a real conflict there with, with the presumption of innocence. There's also, I think, a lot of overlap between criminal trials for terrorism and intelligence gathering and battlefield evidence. This sort of evidence that you need to build a terrorism case um, where it's difficult for an accused to know the source of that evidence and to challenge the source of that evidence. So you've got problems with the right to confrontation. Um, oftentimes there's prolonged incarceration in terrorism trials, which you know bangs up against, again, the presumption of innocence, um, the right to trial without undue delay. Sometimes these things take a really long time because of the complicated nature of the evidence. And also, you know, there, there's an increased use of sometimes transnational repression or cross-border renditions in, ter in terrorist cases um, where there's a lack of judicial oversight and the accused don't necessarily have the chance to challenge their movement across state borders. So, you know, there's a lot of danger zones that come up in relation to terrorist prosecutions that you won't see in, in sort of your run-of-the-mill international crimes case that we all need to be aware of. Many people talk about this need for equality of arms, and people have been talking about it for ages. That you know, the defense counsel need to have the same amount of resources and opportunities to put their case forward. And yet, you mentioned things like battlefield evidence, which is clearly and very often slanted towards the prosecution. You noted that it's very difficult uh, to challenge these uh, extraordinary rendition and kidnapping that bring defendants uh, into court, and then those issues are difficult to raise or are convincing to many judges. What do you think can help, you know, maybe level that very asymmetrical, you know, relationship and make it more of an equality of arms? Well, I think for a start, when there are conversations like this week going on, where we're discussing human rights linkages between 
counter-terrorism responses and, and accountability to have this voice included. So to have people who've worked on the other side, who've defended accused, coming and exchanging um, with prosecutors and with judges and being part of the dialogue, that's a really important first step that I don't think has been happening. Um, a lot of people see equality of arms as a resource issue. We should fund legal aid more effectively. We should fund bar associations more effectively. Of course, that's right. But it, it's more than that. It's making sure that neither party is on an equal, unequal footing vis-a-vis -vis the other party. And so I think um, anyone who's involved in investigation and prosecution of these sorts of crimes has to have that in mind. You know, here's this evidence. Is the defence going to be able to effectively challenge that? Is the defence going to be able to, to learn about and confront front the sources of that evidence? What do we need to do to take steps to be able to declassify that evidence and make it um, available to the defence? Because at the end of the day, these judgments are only valuable if they rely on evidence that's been properly challenged and tested by really competent defence lawyers who, who have the tools to be able to do it. So everyone should want this. You know, we're all in the same game and, and we should be afforded that right to, to play our role because it's an important one. Kate Gibson, I am going to give you a hypothetical wand and you get to, you know, wave it in the air and change one major thing that would help you and others defend the rights of accused terrorists and accused international criminals, alleged international criminals, uh, and to uphold fair trial standards. What is that one Thing that you would change? We've been talking a lot this week here with the prosecutors and the judges who are involved in um, prosecuting and adjudicating terrorism cases and they were talking about the, the real and concrete security risks to them and their families of being involved in, in this area of the law and I am aware that you know colleagues of mine who are defending alleged terrorists also have real threats to the, the, their lives and those of their families. And I think if there's one aspect, if I had one wish, I would try and remove that from this field that we work in. Um, because I don't think anyone should have to subject themselves to, to that sort of concrete security risk just to be able to either defend a, alleged terrorists or, or prosecute or adjudicate them. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a small thing, but if we could just clear that away, um, I think we'd be on a much better footing to, to do the work that we do. Thank you very much, Kate.